Welcome to this time of praise and worship at West Salem Christian Church. I just want to let all of you watching online know that we uh, last Sunday here at the church building had a barbecue after church outside in the field behind the building and it was a great time. We had lots of people who stayed and, and uh, the rain held off just long enough and we were able to, to share some good food and some good conversations together and we also had several people from the community who came. We had mailed out about 70 invitations to to houses around the church building and, and we had quite a few people who came uh, to join us uh, for church and for the, the uh, barbecue. And so I just want to thank all of you who have been praying for that and I think God really used that to help us make some uh, connections and build some relationships with people. Um, and I would like to ask you uh, in that uh, same idea that to go ahead and comment uh, on the streaming screen or click on the connection card tab at the top uh, right corner and, and fill out the connection card just to let us know you're here, uh, what we might be able to do to, to minister to you and, and uh, to help us just stay connected because it's so easy to, uh, to sort of uh, become disconnected, especially online, and we want to do everything we can to stay uh, as close together as we can as a body of Christ. So with that in mind, uh, let's all go together into worship as we worship our uh, Heavenly Father.
Turn in your Bibles to Psalm chapter 16, verses 1 through 8. Again, Psalm chapter 16, verses 1 through 8. Keep me safe, my God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. I say of the holy people who are in the land, they are the noble ones in whom is all my delight. Those who run after other gods will suffer more and more. I will not pour out libations of blood to such gods or take up their names on my lips. Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. Of you make my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. I will praise the Lord who counsels me even at night, my heart instructs me. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Oh, Heavenly Father, you are our refuge. And we do take delight in your strength and in your protection. And Lord, we pray for the people who have other gods, for it is true that they will see less and less good and more and more evil. Father, I thank you for being the one true and living God, and thank you that your power is so great that you overcame death and sin. And how did you do that? Through the miracle and your plan, Jesus Christ, your Son. So, Father, we are grateful. Without him, we are lost. So, Father, as we join together in this moment, whether we're online or you know, together in the house, we're lifting up our prayers of concern, our prayers of fear, 
prayers of anxiety, also prayers of praise, for we know that all of these things are under your watchful eye. Father, we are a stubborn people, sinful people, and that is why Jesus came into the world to redeem. And this week, there is no doubt we failed. Point out through your Holy Spirit, if we do not realize it already, what we have done and what we have omitted. And may we vow in humbleness and seek forgiveness and refresh ourselves at the fountain of his blood. Father, we weekly pray for members of this church and for the church at large, people that we worship with together. We know that there are things that they need, things that they are um, have anxiety over. They're just, you know, they need your presence, Father, and our prayers for them. Father, for the world, it's a lost place, very dark. But we're praying that the light of your word, the light of your son, will spread out into the darkness. And that the people who need you most will now be in, begin to hear your voice, begin to turn to you, begin to stop the, the evil ways and repent and turn around. Father, this day we will be hearing your word. We do every week. We thank you for Seth, who brings the word from his heart to ours. And we pray that it would do the work that you designed it to do, to change our lives, to, to encourage our faith, and of course, to save. So Father, as we continue with worship today in all the things that we do, we pray that this service and our worship will bring glory and honor to you. For it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. There are times in our lives where we just feel like a fish out of water, like we just don't belong. Maybe as a kid, you know, if we move from one school to another, or if we move to a different town or start a new job where we just don't know anybody. It can be very uncomfortable when we don't understand how things work, or if we don't know even how we can relate to the other people around us. For me, it was when I turned 18, graduated high school, moved out of my parents' house, and went to college. I was raised in the small town of Willamina, which is about 30 miles uh, west of, of here at the church. When I was a kid, Willamina was a town of about 1,500 people. Uh, it was a farming and logging community for the most part. Everybody knew everybody, and we all felt pretty safe. When I graduated high school, uh, about 80% of my class had gone all the way from kindergarten through high school to graduation together. It was a great place to grow up, and while it definitely had its share of problems, it was very comfortable, and I was used to it. But my parents wanted me to go somewhere to Bible college for at least a year. Uh, and with the way things worked out, it was obvious for my, that my best option was to go to Pacific Christian College in Fullerton, California. And that's a thousand miles away from Willamina. Fullerton is in Orange County, California, just north of Anaheim, where Disneyland is. And so I went from a town in Oregon of about 1,500 people to the middle of the Orange County, LA metro area, where there are about 12 million people. There was definitely instant culture shock. I'd only driven on the freeway here just a few times, but down there it was almost all freeway driving. I had always been just a five or 10 minute drive from the woods where I could go fishing or camping or hiking or whatever I wanted to do. But in Southern California, you had to drive for hours just to get out of the city in the first place. One of the strangest things was how no one acknowledged each other. I was used to saying hello to everyone I passed walking down the street, whether I knew them or not. But in California, people would just stare at the ground and look right past you. I felt lost, and I wasn't sure where to even begin. But thankfully, my parents had been wise in their decision to send me to a Christian college. As I got to know people in the dorms and in my classes, I realized that Wherever they were from, our stories were pretty similar. 
for the most part, we were all young people with faith in Jesus trying to figure out how to be adults and how to live out our faith in this world. And with the support and wisdom of the professors and other school uh, employees, we were able to grow and learn and mature in a supportive, somewhat safe environment. And it was a huge blessing to me to have people around me who were like me and who were working toward the same goals as I was. And when I think about Paul in the book of Acts, I think about that time in my life, just imagining what it was like for him as he travels from place to place, town to town, region to region, trying to find a way to proclaim the gospel to the people wherever he finds himself. Each city or region is different and it requires something different of him. It couldn't have been an easy thing. In 1 Corinthians 9, 19 through 23, Paul describes what he has done in order to accomplish his mission. He says, though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel that I might share in its blessings. The idea of being a slave is not one that any of us probably like at all. But here Paul says that even though he's free, he has made himself a slave, not just to one person, but to everyone. He's limited himself. He's deprived himself. He's obeyed rules that he didn't have to obey. He's given up some of his rights to be faithful to his responsibility to be a disciple of Jesus who makes disciples. He's sacrificed a lot, and he's made it all about Jesus instead of making it about himself. And he shows us his motivation. He says he's done all of this so that by all possible means, he might save some. Is that our attitude? Do we think that or do we think, oh, I'll do what I can and hope that some people get saved? Or is the desire of our heart that we would do anything possible so that by any means, whatever it takes, someone might be saved? We have to ask ourselves, what do we still have to sacrifice to the mission of the gospel? And I have to say, I still have work to do. I still have selfish ambition and laziness and stubbornness that keeps me from doing everything possible. I hold on to my own comfort and self-control and self-interest and let those things get in the way of doing everything possible to make sure that people are saved. And we all do that because that's easiest. But Paul's an example to us that the easiest thing is very rarely the best thing. And his choosing to be a slave to everyone could not have been easy at all, but it was, it's what was required for him to be faithful to the mission that Jesus gave him, which is the same mission that he's given us. But Paul made some tough choices, and he chose what was best for the message of the gospel. When we last left Paul at the end of Acts 17, he had just delivered his amazing proclamation to the people of Athens. He had used their own false gods and idols to point out to them that, yes, they were looking for something to worship, but they were ignorant of the one true God who was worthy of worship. He preached the gospel to them, and some of them accepted. And just to see if you were listening last week, do you remember what I said the core of the gospel is? I called it the DBR last week, you remember? The heart of the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And that is what Paul preached in Athens and wherever else he went. But I think it was clear that Paul didn't feel completely at home in Athens. In Acts 17, verse 16, it tells us that he was greatly distressed about the number of idols that he found in the city. And that in Athens, he was met with challenge and debate by many people. He has some success there in Athens, but then he moves on to a place called Corinth. And in Corinth, just like Athens, there would be things that would distress Paul. Now, both the cities of Athens and Corinth still exist today, and you can go and visit first century ruins in both places. Today, most of us are probably more familiar with the city of Athens, but in Paul's day, the city of Corinth would have been the bigger, more important city. Athens had lost some of its importance by this point as a trading center and especially as a political center. When the Romans conquered the area, they came in and they set up Corinth as the center of commerce and government in the region. 
And in Paul's day, there may have been as many as 700,000 people that lived in Corinth, making it around 10 times bigger than Athens. It was a place where people and goods from all over the known world would have come in uh, through the port. And it was influenced by all sorts of cultures and, and uh, viewpoints. And, and that influence meant that there were several temples in the city where false gods were worshipped. And the worship of those gods involved all sorts of sexual immorality. The temple of the Roman goddess Venus alone employed over a thousand prostitutes. This was a city that was about as far from living according to God's will as you could get. But that doesn't stop Paul. He, he goes right into the, this very dark city. He's not going to let their sin keep him, keep him from telling them the truth. And he lives up to the words of Jesus in Matthew 5, 14 through 16, where he says, You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to the, everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Paul knows that there's plenty of darkness in this city, but he also sees their need for the light of the gospel. And this is a reminder for us that darkness is an opportunity for the light to shine. Even so, it's going to be a big job and a lonely job for Paul in Corinth. But we come to see that Paul had something in Corinth that he didn't have in Athens. Remember in Athens, he had gone there alone to wait for Silas and Timothy. But let's read Acts 18, 1 through 4. It says, After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker, as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. Here in Corinth, Paul had friends, people who were like him, people who understood him. Priscilla and Aquila were Jewish people who had Roman citizenship, just like Paul. They were tent makers, just like Paul. They were in a new situation in an unfamiliar city, just like Paul. They were expelled from Rome because of their ethnicity, so they have faced persecution, just like Paul. It seemed that this couple were also hospitable and gracious, welcoming Paul into their home and allowing him to partner with them in their tent-making business. We're not explicitly told here whether they were already followers of Jesus when they met Paul or not, but whether they were Christians already or if they became Christians through their relationship with Paul, this couple was committed to the mission of the gospel. And I call them a couple because their names are always mentioned together. You never hear of either one of them mentioned without hearing about the other one. In fact, in five of the seven references to them in Scripture, Priscilla's name is mentioned before Aquila's, which is fairly uncommon for writings of the time, and I think it shows the role that Priscilla played in the ministry of the church in Corinth. And in Priscilla, I think we also see something else very important. The gospel provides purpose and dignity. Imagine what it would have been like as a woman living in the city of Corinth, where everywhere you look, women are being objectified and used, where thousands and thousands of women every night sold their bodies to be used in the worship of false and pagan gods, where the culture and the spiritual climate made most people just look at you as an object. But in the church and in the message and the mission of Jesus, everyone who is a follower of Jesus can find purpose and dignity. Paul reinforces this later in Colossians 3, 11 through 14. Speaking of the church, he says, Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you, and over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Even in these places where things seem so wrong and so dark, the gospel offers every one of us 
the same opportunity to repent, accept forgiveness that Jesus offers, and live for him and, and follow him and serve him as a part of his body and his kingdom. And we see that unity in the early believers in Corinth. Priscilla and Aquila and others continue to work with Paul and the church. But even with everyone working together, Paul still faces opposition and persecution from the Jews in the synagogue. In Acts 8, verses uh, 5 through 8, we read, When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. But when they opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent of it. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Then Paul left the synagogue and went next door to the house of Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. Crispus, the synagogue leader, and his entire household believed in the Lord, and many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptized. You see what happens here? This is really sad to me. This synagogue leader basically had to leave the church to get saved. He and his household understood and believed the truth about Jesus, but the other people in the synagogue just reacted in, an in anger and, and violence. I have a friend who goes to another church, and he's this very humble, wise, amazing person, and he's a great leader, and, and he gets things done. And he had been a leader in the church, but he had stepped away from some of those positions, and he, he still attended every week, and he was still in, really involved and supportive, just not in leadership roles. And as we were talking about it, he said something that was very sad, but very true. He said, I realized that I could accomplish more for Jesus outside the structure of the church. And that hurts, but it was actually true in his case. And I think this synagogue leader and my friend show us that we can't put God or the gospel in a box. God tried to send his son to his people and they rejected him. Paul took the gospel to the synagogues first, everywhere he went, but the majority of them violently rejected the message. The people of this synagogue should have been the first to recognize the truth that Paul was saying. They knew the scriptures. They knew the prophecies. They had been anticipating the arrival of the Messiah, but they were too caught up in tradition and expectation and thinking that they knew it all to recognize the very thing that they thought they wanted. But God isn't limited by their stubbornness. He can work in the other people of the city, outside the framework of the synagogue and, and all that tradition to move the gospel forward. And I think we have to take this as a caution to keep our eyes on Jesus. We have to be careful not to get busy doing church and lose sight of the goal. If we become centered and focused on anything other than the gospel, we risk losing our way. And today there are so many things, so many issues, so many debates and arguments that we can fall on either side of. And when I say that, I'm sure that at least three or four issues pop into your head automatically. And a lot of the issues in our culture today are things that are important that for us as Christians to understand and, and to take a stand on. But no issue can take precedence over the gospel. Every issue has to be looked at through the lens of the gospel not the other way around. We can't let the shifting sands in the world around us make us take our eyes off of the gospel of Jesus because God will be at work. But if we aren't careful, we might miss out on the opportunity for him to work through us. We see an example of that as we move down in Acts chapter 18. After Paul has dealt with so much persecution and resistance, basically everywhere he's gone, God gives him a little reassurance. Verses 9 through 11 say, One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one is going to attack and harm you, because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half, teaching them the word of God. Well, that must have been nice for Paul. There's a weight off his shoulders. I, I would have stayed for a long time, too, with a promise like that. But after that year and a half, there seems to be a wrench in the works here. Picking up in verses 12 and 13, it says, While Gallio was proconsul of, of Achaia, the Jews of Corinth made an attack on Paul and brought him to the place of judgment. This man, they charged, is persuading the people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. Well, what's going on here? Did, did God forget his promise? Is he not big enough to protect Paul like he said he would? Let's see 
the rest of the story in verses 14 through 17. Just as Paul was about to speak, Gallio said to them, If you Jews were making a complaint about some misdemeanor or serious crime, it would be reasonable for me to listen to you. But since it involves questions about words and names and your own law, settle the matter yourselves. I will not be a judge of such things. So he drove them off. And then the crowd there turned on Sosthenes, the synagogue leader, and beat him in front of the proconsul. And Gallio showed no concern whatsoever. So God kept his promise. Paul was saved from being attacked, but who did God use to do it? Who was one of God's people in the city? Gallio, this Roman proconsul, who he did the work of God. And I think, I think there's a couple interesting things when we look at that. First, God used this pagan leader of men to accomplish his will because the people in the synagogue who should have known better weren't paying attention. And second, God used the choice of the Jews in the synagogue against them. They had chosen the law over the gospel, and it was their law that they appealed to. But Gallio didn't know or care what their law said, so their attempt to stand in the way of the gospel failed. And when I look at us, I hope that God wouldn't have to work through anyone else, but that we would be available and willing and ready to sacrifice for the mission of the gospel that our lives and our faith would shine light into even the darkest situation, that we would find our purpose, dignity, and identity in the gospel, and that we would view this world and everything in this life through the lens of the gospel, and then be ready to allow God to work through us to accomplish his will. Let's pray. Father, it is so easy to get distracted. It's so easy to look at the the challenges and to think, well, I don't have what it takes, or I don't know enough, or I'm not comfortable enough in this situation, or, or whatever it is to, to really take those steps of faith to, to do what you've called us to do and, and to, uh, to be who you have called us to be. But we ask that you'd help us to have the courage to know that our light might be just the light that's needed to, to shine into a dark place. That our willingness to step forward might be just what you need to to accomplish your will in a certain situation. And and we don't want to miss the chance to have you work through us. We know that you can accomplish your will any way that you want to, but our desire would be to be a part of that and that we would be willing to allow you to work in us and, and through us and that you would use us as your people to accomplish your will and help us to make the gospel the main thing. And to, yes, know about issues and and things going on and, and know what your word says and take a stand for what you say is right. But that we would look at everything in this world through the lens of the gospel and interpret our world through your word and not the other way around. Because we want you to be on the throne of our hearts and we want our lives to be centered on you. So we thank you for your love. Thank you for Jesus that he redeemed us so that we could know you, that we could have a relationship with you, and we can have your spirit to, uh, to lead us every day. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. the praise we could ever bring worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you jesus the name above every other name jesus the only one who could ever say of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you we live for you holy there is no one like you there is none beside you open up my eyes in wonder show me who you are 
Jesus did a lot of very powerful things during his life and ministry, uh, as we see in the Gospels, the way that he taught, the way that he spoke, the authority that he had uh, was, was amazing to people. He was very powerful in the way that he, he communicated, uh, in, in the stories that he told, the parables and ways that he was able to use simple, everyday things to explain uh, very important issues. The answers that he gave, the questions that he asked, all of these things were very powerful in the way that he did them. But one of the most powerful things I think that, that Jesus did was the way that he touched people. Jesus would touch people who were blind, who were lepers, people who had uh, health issues and, and things that made them untouchable in that culture. And yet Jesus would touch them. And we all know how powerful the human touch can be, whether we're holding someone's hand who is, is uh, distraught or, or concerned, whether we're embracing someone, giving them a hug, or, or even just a simple pat on the back or a hand on someone's shoulder can communicate so much love and compassion. And uh, touch is so important that people who are isolated and unable to touch or be touched by other people, often suffer, suffer worse health issues and, and uh, their, their health deteriorates quickly when they are uh, so isolated from other people. And Jesus knew that touch was important. And there's lots of ways that God uh, works in our life through his word. He communicates to us. He appeals to our, our hearts and to our minds and to our logic and, and our reason. But when we come to the table, when we come to communion, it's a place where God touches us, where we, we touch Jesus. In Mark 14, beginning in verse 22, it says, While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and 
When he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to the disciples, saying, Take, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, he said to them. Jesus told his disciples, and we continue the tradition, that his body and his blood are represented here in communion. And there's something special about communion because it does involve our senses. It's not just us hearing something or reading something, but it's an experience, it's a participation that we have in touching Jesus and remembering the sacrifice that he made for us. And so we take the bread to remember his body that was broken. And we take the juice to remember his blood that was poured out for our sins. Let's pray. Father, thank you for touching our lives. Thank you for your spirit that is within us, that you are literally with us all the time. But thank you for communion, a, an act that we can be a part of, a step that we can take, a participation we can have in remembrance of what Jesus did, where we can touch the bread, taste the juice, and know that the sacrifice that Jesus made for us was real, and that uh, we can remember that and, uh, and again, confess and repent for the things that we've done and, and uh, go again from this place uh, to, to live for Jesus each day. So we thank you for the way you've touched us and you, we ask that you'd help us to, to uh, live our lives in a way that touches other people so that they can know the gospel too. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. For our time of giving, I want to tell you a story that I heard a friend of mine tell recently. It's about a young man from Akron, Ohio, whose name was Elgin Staples. He was just kind of an ordinary guy, and in 1941, he joined the Navy, and uh, in 1942, he was on a ship that was uh, a part of a night battle with a Japanese fleet. He was a signalman third class. He was stationed next to a turret on, on the ship, and that turret took a direct hit, and he was blown into the water. He had an injury on both legs from shrapnel, and he could have easily drowned, but he remembered as he was in the water that he had a, a life belt on, this rubber belt that he pulled a cord on, and it inflated with air, and it kept him afloat in the water uh, as the battle went on around him. And hours later, he was picked up by another American ship, actually then taken back to his original ship, where he was back in the middle of the fight. And after that ship that he was on had taken over 65 impacts from Japanese uh, weapons, it finally sank. And uh, he was back in the water again. And that same uh, life belt was still usable and, and kept him afloat again, saved his life one more time, and he was able to, to stay afloat until he was picked up again by another American ship. He was taken to a, a naval hospital in San Diego where he began to recover and he regained enough strength to start to look around and, and realize what was going on. And he, he saw that that, that, uh, that life belt was still there. He still had it with him. And so he got looking at it and he thought, hey, this is made by the Akron Rubber Company in Akron, Ohio. What are the odds that the belt that saved my life was made in my own hometown? And so he decided to hold on to it as a memento. And, and uh, as he began to get better and, and get stronger, he got approved for some leave to go home and to visit his mother. And so he went back to Akron and, and he saw his mother and he told her all about everything he'd been through and all the adventures he'd had. And, and he said, I, I was saved by this, this uh, life belt that uh, it saved me twice. And I realized it was made here in Akron in my own hometown. And she said, oh, well, I'm familiar with those belts. I've been volunteering at the Akron uh, Rubber Company to, to uh, inspect those types of belts just to help with the war effort. And, and so I've been an inspector for those. And so she took the, the belt, she started looking, and she found a tag that said inspected by such and such number. And she said, this is my number. I inspected this safety belt, or this, this life belt. And so his mother 
had been the one to inspect that belt which served him so well and saved his life twice over. Now, I'm not saying that God somehow miraculously saved this man's life because of his mother. But what I think this story illustrates is that she didn't know what her service was going to do. She didn't know that by inspecting these life belts, by, by doing her part, doing what she could just to help, that that was going to save her son's life. And very often, we don't know what our giving is going to do. To selflessly give to God is, is an act of worship, but then we don't know how, how that's going to be used, how God's going to produce uh, good things out of that. We don't know how, how blessings are going to come back our way, but we know that in humble giving and cheerful giving that God can do great things. Luke chapter 6, verse 38, Jesus says, Give and it will be given to you a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. That doesn't mean that we're going to get back exactly what we give or, or in the same form that we give. But what it means is if, if the measure that we use is, is selfless, humble, uh, generous giving, then that's the way that we're going to receive what we really need back from our Heavenly Father is in uh, a generous way. So we have the opportunity to, to humbly come and worship God by giving to Him. And, uh, and we can then sit back and, and watch to see what He's going to do with that gift and, uh, and how He's going to bless us in return. Well, this has been a great time to be together as the body of Christ, to share together in God's word and in our praise and worship of him. I want to invite you back, as always, uh, next week at 1030 a.m., both in person at the church building and here online, we'll be gathering again for worship. As we get ready to close and sing our last song, I just want to pray over you this blessing that's found in Numbers chapter 6, beginning in verse 24. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen.
Lord.